Thank you, Ines, and uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for staying uh, and having the stamina to stay until the end of the conference. And I have to say that as a last speaker, I am in a somewhat uh, peculiar position. On the one hand, I have listened to all of your presentations, and I had a chance to uh, tweak and perhaps correct what I was about to say. So that's definitely a benefit. On the other hand, I realized that I am the only thing that's standing between you and the well-deserved Friday night, uh, which makes me feel a certain pressure to say something exceptionally valuable, which unfortunately I cannot promise. What I can promise is that um, I will do my uh, very best to stick to the time limits and uh, not to go beyond that. So in the next um, 25 minutes or so, I will first outline um, some of the challenges arising from uh, the interaction between the legal systems of the European Commission on Human Rights and, and, uh, and the EU. Uh, then I will offer some points for your consideration in how to perhaps deal with these challenges or at least what are the questions that should be asked in, uh, in searching uh, for responses to these challenges. So altogether I will speak about three sets of challenges and uh, three points to consider. Uh, but before I go to substance, um, I need to briefly explain my professional background so you understand where I'm coming from and what circumstances have influenced the way I approach uh, the issues discussed at today's conference. Um, I have been in the diplomatic service of Latvia for about 25 years now, and for most of that time I have dealt with fundamental rights. And again, for most of that time I've represented Latvia before the European Court of Human Rights and also the UN treaty bodies. Therefore, I have a very strong state perspective to whatever I, I approach. Being the representative of a state before the European Court of Human Rights often means also the reverse function. I represent the European Court of Human Rights, or in broader sense, the fundamental rights before state institutions in Latvia. So it means that I am to some extent conditioned to expect very straightforward and very practical questions from uh, law enforcement officers, from judges, from civil servants, who would often say, fine, we know Article 2 of the Treaty of the European Union recognizes respect for human rights as a founding value of the EU. What exactly does that mean in my case, number one, two, three, as regards persons A, return from country A to country B under the, uh, under the Dublin regulation? So what my interlocutors usually require at are at least some markers, some points of reference, and that's exactly how um, instinctively I approach um, also possible responses to the challenges uh, arising from the interaction of various legal systems. Now, to, um, to the description of uh, Carmen's situation and um, some challenges that I see. Um, as the title of, of my presentation suggests, uh, uh, in literature, quite often I have seen the phrase that the Europe's, Europe's architecture for fundamental right protection is described as a crowded house. You have national systems, including constitutional courts, you have the Council of Europe, you have the EU, you have the OSCE, and of course also the UN. So it's, it is a very um, intricate and dense system. Uh, for the purposes of um, this presentation, I'll stick to the Council of Europe and the EU, uh, mostly because these are the institutions with the strongest judicial factor, so it's something to, uh, to, to ease the comparison. And again, uh, I will approach uh, these challenges mostly from the perspective, of course, the EU and uh, EU member states. As I warned you, I have this very strong state perspective. So, Challenges I have uh, loosely grouped in, in three categories. The first challenge could be described as a fragmentation of human rights law, which is a potentially negative consequence of simple coexistence in the same legal space of two human rights instruments, the Council of Europe, European Commission on Human Rights, and the EU Charter on Fundamental Rights. Of course, these two instruments are very close in substance, 
uh, they have uh, the, the Treaty of, on the European Union and the Charter itself. They establish institutionally and formally the link between these two um, documents. But of course, they are not identical. Yesterday, it was already noted that Charter is, was drafted and adopted way later than the uh, Council of Europe Convention, and therefore, uh, Charter contains rights that were not acknowledged at the time the European Convention on Human Rights was drafted, from the right to good administration to, to rights to uh, access of documents. Also, some of the rights in, in Charter are drafted differently, formulated differently than, um, than in a convention, for example, the right to life. Um, it is, in my opinion, very interesting um, that researchers have noted that since the Charter has gained um, legal force, the court, and as a result, the EU legal order uh, has its own human rights catalogue, the Court of Justice of the European Union is not referring in its rulings as often to the Convention on Human Rights as it did before the Charter formally entered into force. Um, I found some interesting numbers. For example, between 1998 and 2005, that's a span of seven years, uh, the, court, the CJU referred to the European Convention on Human Rights 7.5 times more than all other human rights instruments, including the Charter. So the European Convention on Human Rights was obviously the instrument uh, referred to by, by, the, by the court to uh, interpret um, uh, human rights provisions. After 2009, between 2009 and 2012, that's a three-year period, uh, once the Charter has, um, has, has gained the legal force, um, the Charter was referred in 122 judgments, so it's 122, while the Convention only in 20 cases. So you see this radical drop in a, uh, simple references uh, to the European Convention on Human Rights in, in the case law of the CJU. So the question arises whether fewer references uh, to the European Convention on Human Rights and the case law of, of Strasbourg Court weaken the link between the two systems and whether that's indicative of a divergence and not of a convergence, which I would submit is at odds with uh, the idea of single European legal space that we often speak about. The other two sets of challenges, in addition or resulting from the fragmentation, um, are different levels of protection for individual and uncertainty for the member state as to the content of their obligations. I'll explain the both, uh, both challenges um, by, by using some uh, references to the case law. For example, um, the famous uh, uh, Dublin cases and how a state uh, is expected to comply with the principle of non refoulement in the CJU uh, case law, uh, it has clearly held that uh, under Article 4 of the Charter, which um, contains the prohibition of torture and inhuman or degrading treatment, it, this uh, prohibition of torture and degrading treatment must be interpreted as um, preventing an EU member state from transferring asylum seeker to another member state if uh, the first member state is aware of systemic different difficulties in the uh, member state of destination, uh, particularly with respect to uh, reception conditions in asylum centers, uh, in other words, the conditions, the material conditions um, uh, of detention. But the emphasis is on systemic differences. If you compare that with the uh, European Court of Human Rights, uh, it goes way further and says that in addition to systemic issues, the state must examine individual situation of the applicants. In other words, even if everything is fine system-wise, uh, from the perspective of Strasbourg, the person still cannot be transferred to another member state if that particular person, because of uh, I don't know, disability or any other uh, ca characteristics might face a situation that would amount to inhuman or degrading treatment. So you could argue that a person 
confines him or herself in two entirely different legal situations, having exactly the same facts, merely depending on whether the situation is looked at from the perspective of EU law or from the perspective of the Council of uh, Europe and European Commission on Human Rights, which again is, in my opinion, not entirely uh, in line with the concept of uh, uh, European legal order, European legal space. From the perspective of member states, uh, which is, I would say, very acutely felt by, by the judges who are on the front lines of applying uh, the relevant law to the case, and if uh, cases are complex enough, they would have uh, national law plus EU law plus uh, European Commission human rights. So for the member state, the challenge is the need to comply simultaneously with the principle of mutual recognition and mutual trust and with the obligation to provide individualized examination of the situation under the European Convention on Human Rights. So as, as some of the judges have, have uh, told me, they describe the situation that you are between a rock and a hard place. On the one hand, the EU law requires the judge to comply with the principle of uh, uh, mutual trust and presume the compliance with EU law and with fundamental rights in the state of destination. Or in a, if we're talking about the uh, uh, recognition and enforcement of a foreign judgment, that this judgment in another EU member state has been adopted in full compliance with fundamental rights. So if the national judge complies with the principle of mutual trust, he or she might create a situation that would amount to a violation of a fundamental rights under the European Convention on Human Rights because he or she has not engaged in individualized examination. And the other way around, if the judge uh, undertakes this individualized examination, uh, the principle of mutual trust is, is for all intents and purposes, um, disregarded. Um, it, is, it, it has been um, em emphasized on a number of occasions that this indeed is a very practical issue. Some relief, uh, one could argue, uh, be seen from the uh, 2016 Aranyosi case, where the CJU uh, clearly stated that in some exceptional situations, if the EU member state is a, in a possession of evidence of uh, real, risk, real risk of uh, uh, inhuman or degrading treatment, then the principle of mutual trust can be disregarded and uh, uh, individualized examination uh, uh, needs to be undertaken. Uh, in my opinion, uh, this approach of the CJU, uh, it could be argued that in, in this way, uh, the CJU is also responding to uh, increased calls for addressing the rule of law backsliding that this is one of the way within the uh, existing uh, legal framework and the CJU has found a way to still maintain the uh, coherence of the system but um, identify certain, um, certain exceptions that, that could be used. So these three challenges, uh, the fragmentation, different levels of protection for the individual and uh, perhaps lack of clarity for the member states um, as to the content of their obligations, in my opinion, uh, could characterize the current um, um, interaction between the EU legal system and the Council of Europe. Now, on uh, three points that, in my opinion, could be uh, borne in mind when, uh, when looking for ways to address these challenges. My first point concerns diversity. Uh, yesterday and today I had a number of speakers uh, saying that diversity can be a positive thing. I agree. Uh, I think that uh, in dealing with uh, diversity, uh, very eloquent uh, English uh, uh, idiom applies, namely don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. So in dealing with, uh, in trying to limit the diversity and in seeking harmonization, we should not uh, eliminate those elements of the diversity that are in fact uh, beneficial to the system. Uh, the European Convention on Human Rights and the EU Charter, they were meant to be different. The pool of states uh, whose practice is relevant for in interpreting these two legal instruments, the pool is different. Uh, the nature of judicial review in, in Luxembourg and in, in Strasbourg, those are different. Uh, 
uh, I'm not sure I can agree with, uh, uh, with the proposal that cases in Strasbourg are simpler than, than in, in Luxembourg. They're definitely different. Um, and they are, how should I put it? They are much more fact, individual fact-based compared to, to Luxembourg. They can be very emotional. Um, this Wednesday, there was a hearing in Strasbourg before the Grand Chamber uh, about a case of a Syrian family uh, who had applied to a Belgian consulate in Lebanon uh, seeking humanitarian visa. You know the case, yes. Um, in, in this situation, the, uh, the, the, the very interesting legal questions, whether submitting a document for visa, uh, receiving a rejection, and that rejection being reviewed by the Belgian courts creates a jurisdiction of Belgium over those persons. But those are legal issues emphasized by the states. What the applicants and their representatives very rightly did, they tried to uh, push the court of, European Court of Human Rights to look at this situation as a situation of family, of a family of four with two minor children living for two years in Aleppo in apartments without running water and electricity. So they're making it very personal and very emotional. So the incredibly difficult task for the Strasbourg court is to see how to deal with this painful situation within the system and how to balance the very uh, human and humane wish to help these particular people without jeopardizing the whole system. So um, that's, I, I think, is probably uh, one of the differences between the Luxembourg and Strasbourg. Uh, but um, I think they're equally, equally important and, and complex. So to continue, the, the first point about the diversity and that it can have um, very beneficial effects is, is we need to keep in mind that uh, uh, the state is obliged not only to respect human rights, but also to promote fundamental rights and freedoms. In other words, what also was mentioned yesterday, this progressive evolution, development of uh, fundamental rights. And, and we could argue that um, harmonization runs the risk of becoming rigid and uh, limiting the room for growth and preventing from uh, fundamental rights from developing. So in other words, diversity, divergence, it's not entirely negative. It can stimulate positive development, but I would submit inc only if it remains within certain limits. And those limits, in my opinion, could be defined by the values that are common to the Council of Europe and, and the EU, because they mostly derive from the member states. Uh, one can compare the preamble of the European Convention on Human Rights, the Charter, Article 2 of the Treaty on the European Union. You would see the same, uh, same concepts referred to as the founding values. So, to summarize my first point that uh, needs to be borne in mind in, in looking at ways to address the current challenges is that we actually need the diversity, provided that this stays within certain limits. My next point uh, tries to address uh, the very last sentence of, of my previous point. In other words, what are those limits, what are those values that, that could define the, um, the extent of diversity? And I think we need to be very clear what we talk about. And uh, I would submit that values is something different than human rights protection standards. Values as standards are not the same. In Article 2 of the Treaty on European Union, we talk about respect for fundamental rights as one of the founding values. The standards, in my opinion, operationalize the value. So the standards would be very precise, technical um, instruments that allow uh, those values uh, to come to life. But I also think that we need to monitor whether the standards we draft, 
actually allow these values to be maintained and whether there is a danger of those standards undermining the value. So when I say um, that diversity needs to be um, limited by values, I mean values, not standards. My third point, again bearing in mind the, the usual questions I hear from, from my um, colleagues, where can we find these values? Where are they defined? Where can I look for? Uh, I might not have the answer to the question where one needs to look to, to find a definition of the values, but I wish to offer an idea where not to look for the values. So to approach the question from the other side, to eliminate uh, places uh, that could be used for uh, looking for values. Uh, again, bearing in mind my previous point about the difference between the values and standards. And I submit that uh, values are rarely found in intergovernmentally negotiated technical instruments. And such as framework decision on European arrest warrant. Um, I spent 10 years uh, as a diplomat uh, working uh, in Geneva and New York in the representation of Latvia before the UN. And most of that time, of course, uh, was spent uh, drafting uh, common EU positions and common EU statements. And uh, what we came to realize is that EU was constantly accused uh, by NGOs, by civil society, by like-minded countries, that our statements deliver the lowest common denominator. That if, it, if it's a text that needs to be agreed among the governments, there's very little room for progressive development and, and evolution. It will most often than not represent the basic minimum the states can agree on. So to extrapolate from, from this point about uh, EU's position in, in the UN. Again, my experience uh, in the Council of the European Union and in the working group uh, confirms that it's very difficult to um, agree on uh, large conceptual issues at the intergovernmental level. So, to reiterate, I think that those kinds of instruments should not be source of uh, inspiration when we act, what we actually need are the values. You might have guessed that I'm indirectly alluding to the Maloney case, um, but I need to clarify that I do not um, immediately question the outcome of the Maloney case. My question rather is about the methodology and about the instruments used. I haven't done the, the, the simulation, but it might be that um, the outcome would be exactly the same, even if uh, the CJU used not the framework decision, but Article 2, the sincere cooperation, any, any other um, concept that would, I think, be more representative of values than the standards. So... Um, as I said, I would not be able to pinpoint precisely the source of values for, for example, a national judge wishing to apply those in, 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 in his or her case, but uh, uh, I hope I've outlined what I think is not the way to, to approach uh, uh, the difference. To conclude, um, the interaction between the Council of Europe, the, the EU, and, um, Council and member states, uh, it is here, it will remain. Uh, we'll see whether or not the EU's accession to the Convention on Human Rights uh, takes place, if and on, on what conditions. But meanwhile, the court in Strasbourg will continue examining the cases that involve the EU law, the CJU will continue examining the cases that involve fundamental rights. So uh, this interaction will continue. And uh, if the EU wishes to uphold the title of uh, union of values, then I think these values, we, are, we cannot allow their uh, 
uh, erosion for simple sake of convenience. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Christine. Questions? Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, Christine, I get a question. Um, you said that actually you agree that diversity is a good thing. But uh, don't you think that it might uh, make a problem if there is no certain border up, up to when, where can, can this diversity go? Because uh, the same as, you know, the values, uh, you know, values is like uh, every nation can say that, oh, we get a little bit different, so we can go a little bit further. Or, no, we don't go so far. So it's uh, no strict line up to where it can, can go, this diversity. Because the, exactly you began that it's good, but it, it should be underlined, you know, at, or, or certain border, border should be. And then you said, like, uh, oh, we shouldn't determine it exactly. So it's like uh, you said no. uh, something like it was a double standard. So well, then I must have um, not been very clear. What I started with uh, was the danger of fragmentation, which I, in my opinion, is the negative side of the diversity. Uh, but what I attempted to say is that diversity has also positive elements and that the diversity should be contained within the value of respect for fundamental rights. I very much share the temptation of uh, looking for precise lines. I'm afraid that we'll never find them. Uh, for simple reason, um, you yourself mentioned the, um, uh, the nuanced differences among the member states, but also uh, the gradual evolution of legal thinking, the, the morals in society, the ethics in society. So in, in fun, human rights law, I think it's, uh, it can be counterproductive to try and establish strict limits to what, uh, which direction or, or to what extent um, an understanding can, can develop. Uh, 50 years ago, 20 years ago, the question of um, uh, online freedom of speech was never there. And uh, up until recently, uh, you could hear arguments that the principles about the balancing between the right to privacy and the freedom of uh, speech are not applicable to online world. So, but it's, it has gone beyond that because of the developments at the national level as well. So even though I, I share your wish of finding a certain limit, I don't think they are there. And that in turn means additional burden on those applying the law in practice to be aware of the broader framework and to um, re refrain or prevent mechanical application of the law, very formal application of the law. It, it, it must involve thinking, as, as simple as that. Just, uh, I can explain a little bit why, why I'm so like, uh, strict, why I would like to have this line, and uh, I can say that I'm a bit aware, because in Europe now, mostly I mean the Western Europe, it's uh, is get, got more and more popular the national movements like in Poland, in France, like was Marie Le Pen the same. So a lot of uh, polit political players, they start the moves like, uh, we don't need you. So we are even can be better without them. So if we don't put a straight, strict line, so in certain period of time, this, this movement can erase so, so, so high that it will just... Hmm. You are entering yeah. the area of freedom of speech. Uh, when are you trying to censor uh, opinions that you disagree with? Um, I think that's one of the topics in Europe, especially considering the conceptual difference between the Europe and the US in, the, in approaching the freedom of speech. 
and my colleagues from the US, they have great difficulty understanding our concepts of, for example, hate speech, because their history has spared what we saw in the 30s and 40s, where, un where the, uh, thank you, somebody agrees with us, um, uh, uh, where the unlimited, uh, the, the freedom to say, regardless of the consequences resulted in, um, in utter horror. So, of course, in, in Europe, our approach to, to freedom of expression is more restrictive and, than in the US, but at the same time, as regards political speech and international or supranational organizations, I am not sure that's an area that can be censored or limited or the level of criticism could be limited. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you for an excellent presentation, and I agree with almost everything that you have said, possibly even with everything that you have said, even if you may be surprised, because, but maybe there may have been some understanding okay. of what I said, but we'll talk about that later on. I would like to just ask a question about the fragmentation, the fragmentation and the diversity per se that you see as, as a, a possible problem. I would suggest that that problem exists in one way only between the EU and the ECHR, and that would be if... Um, the EU's, if the EU goes below the floor of um, the ECHR, so if it goes below the minimum uh, protection that the ECHR offers, um, if the, the, and as you rightly say, the EU is the charter is supposed to be different than the ECHR, but it's also supposed to offer higher mm -hmm. protection, right? It says so explicitly, and and the ECHR also wants the EU to do that. So I would su suggest that um, in that respect. Fragmentation, fragmentation it has a negative con mm -hmm. uh, connotation. Diversity is to be welcomed and applauded if uh, the EO goes up. Um, I would uh, suggest that when you have to go back and talk to national uh, actors and national representatives, I would um, suggest that indeed that if they do find themselves in, and, and I, I agree with you that the, the challenges are mainly for the individuals and for the state authorities mm -hmm. who feel themselves trapped between mm -hmm. two, that if they do feel trapped in a case where the EU seems to be going below the ECHR standards, um, tell the EU. Tell the, so national courts should always, I would suggest, make the preliminary reference to, to the EU and phrase it in this term. Um, should the charter be interpreted as saying this and that mm -hmm. because the ECHR says that and we will stick to that minimum. Mm -hmm. So the threat or the dialogue could be like this is, this is really what we want to do. So this is, would be a suggestion to differentiate mm -hmm. between types of diversity, mm -hmm. which one goes up and which one goes down, with the, 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 the challenge, of course, that in case of competing rights, mm -hmm more protection for one means less for the other. Mm -hmm. And then I did have a question also on the standard. Oh yeah, on Meloni, to be clear, I fully agree with you. I fully agree with you and this is why I said yesterday that with Meloni there should be a condition added that is not clear from the decision on the first reading, namely that it can only apply if the standard that is set at the EU level complies with the charter. Mm. And the, mm. the, uh, if mm -hmm. you read Maloney, the decision, the, the, the part that is usually read is, is the second part, right? But there is a first part where the court checks whether that particular provision, whether or not a, a person should be surrendered, um, if he has been uh, sentenced in absentia, um, whether that complies. So that provision in the charter and saying namely that it can only be done if the person knew that he was prosecuted, if he was mm -hmm. represented, etc. Does that comply with the charter? Yes, it does. 
So that is what the court did, except that in the second part, the court then says, well, the member states agreed, so it is a common standard. Well, I beg your pardon, but that, that is not what the court is supposed to do. The court is supposed to check whether what the, court, the, the member states have agreed complies with the charter. So I fully agree with you on Maloney. Thank you. Uh, th thank you, and thank you for those uh, comments. Uh, to, to come back briefly on the fragmentation and, and diversity. Again, it, it, uh, my discourse must have been influenced by my usual habitats, which is the, the state authorities. And, and I easily can understand uh, a first instance judge who, who needs to, in relatively short amounts of time, come up with a solution to the case that withstands the scrutiny at appeal and, and uh, uh, third instance courts or, or even before the European Court of Human Rights. And um, uh, I've noticed uh, often uh, reluctance among uh, judges to uh, be innovative because it opens them for uh, for criticism and uh, you need to have a very you need to be a very strong person to readily go for that but uh, it is certainly a, a, an issue to emphasize in in any format thank you It's, it's more a comment than, than, a, than a question because it, it concerns the, the ECHR. When we talk about minimum standards, I always have a little bit of problem with saying that ECHR only protects minimum standards because we see how it grows. Mm -hmm. uh, even in such sort of firm rights as in humane treatment, um, Winter case would be um, yeah, that's the case, right, where, where, where the slap was considered to be inhumane, just one slap by police authorities. So I think that, that if we talk about minimum standards, I think that the ECHR time after time raises them mm -hmm. uh, to meet new challenges, not only in, 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 in novel issues as, which concern fundamental freedoms, uh, with, with, with online, with freedom of religion, uh, with, uh, with cultures migrating and so on, I think even with, with relatively established cases, we see that the minimum standard shifts, it goes mm -hmm. higher, and, and that's why I think that it could also, we could see how those minimum standards could, could, could overgrow mm -hmm. the, the, the mm -hmm. sort of, and that's, that's another challenge that we, we, can, um, we can look at. Um, so that's okay. more of a comment. Yeah, thank you. I agree. So even minimum standards can be extremely high and too high in some cases. 